Yamaha CR820. A really nice quality vintage 50 watt per channel receiver. I love the way these things are built. Uh, I know we just did a Yamaha from this era, uh, the baby of this, and uh, this one's a little more full featured, has a little more power, and uh, same nice cabinet and everything. I don't know if it works or not. Uh, I got it a while back and I don't remember what the problem was. I don't know if it's got a channel out or if it's functional. So we're going to try that out. But nice little receiver and uh, hopefully we'll fix this one up and it'll be another good one to go to someone's home and uh, provide many, many years of enjoyment. Okay, amplifiers plugged in and connected to dim bulb. Power on. And we have a protect relay, that's good. All right, let's turn speaker A on. Turn it around and let's just see if we have any kind of offset on here. Let me get something to keep this thing from drifting on me. There we go. I like the little Lazy Susan table for rotating this around, but it drifts, you know, it floats on you, so you have to kind of prop it. All right, I'm going to go to millivolts. Well, let's go to volts first, just in case there's something really wrong. Okay, speaker A. Go into here, and that doesn't look bad at all. Looks like about 15 millivolts. That's good. Look at the left channel. About 88. Oh, I was wrong. 1.5 millivolts, and this is 8.5 millivolts. So I was off by a decimal. 8.5. Beautiful. I think we can try this out. Okay, so I have the electronic circuit breaker connected and I have it just set to trip at about one and a half amps to two amps and have the radio or the receiver turned on. I'm set to auxiliary input, speaker A connected up to some speakers, playing some audio our favorite song. All right, let's see what happens. Ooh. Well, that's not good. <laughs> Obviously, there is a problem. So, I don't know. We either have the world's dirtiest control or something else is wrong in there. So, okay. Well, we'll check it out. We'll see what it is. The good news is we didn't have DC offset. The safety, the protect relay was not dropping out. And even though it was only static, both channels were making noise. So that tells us that it's got to be something in the preamp or in the line stage or something. So that's what we're going to look at first. So let's get this thing out of the cabinet, see what it looks like inside, and start troubleshooting. Okay, rather than having the typical amount of dust inside, which is not bad, this receiver looks by and large untouched, at least from the front side. Uh, there's the potentiometer for the volume and balance, and I think the first thing we'll start with is just cleaning the potentiometer, just spray the pot and work it back and forth a few times and see if that gets rid of that problem. It might, but it also might not. There could be something else going on. But being that both channels are doing the same thing, that's kind of strange. Bottom of the board looks pristine. I don't see any evidence that anybody worked on this. Of course, that's the famous last words, isn't it? We see on the surface it <laughs> things look good. But there's no rust, no corrosion. Uh, really nice. So I do think this thing got 
dropped or something because that's what that why that corner got dinged up and that might have been in shipping I don't remember I mean where it was stored I don't see how that could have happened here but it's been such a long time that's been sitting here who knows but the rest of it looks really really good so yeah yeah it must have been dropped in shipping because if you look down here you can see this is kind of bowed down just ever so slightly which would have been on the corner that got dinged up so yeah this was this was damaged in shipping I'm sure because th this came shipped to me in a box and anything heavy like this anymore you just can't ship these things that's why I don't like to I won't take outside jobs or anything so just too many times things get damaged all right let's clean the control all right I did a little spray and pray on the volume pot here <clears throat> and uh, put a new power cord on it because that one was so short it kept getting caught on everything we're hooked back up let's turn it on I have some music queued up and let's see what happens all right okay let's see what happens One channel is out. And now it's back on. sounds just like I would expect this Yamaha to sound well we just need to clean the controls and well other than that it's ready to go now what I think I will do because this is right around that era that these capacitors here could be well they all look really good now and probably if I tested them they would test good but I think because this is an easy one to do, and this is going to be a pretty boring video if all I do is spray some controls and change a power cord, uh, let's do a recap and we'll do a uh, solder and chat for no other reason than just to do it and to make this thing ready to last many, many more years. Oh, I love the smell of butyric acid in the morning. <laughs> Can you smell that? I sure can. It smells like vomit. Any of you that own this type of Exolite tool, anything from this era uh, with these plastic handles, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, these things were made in the 1980s, in the 70s, and they, as the plastic breaks down, they give off a uh, type of gas that's called butyric acid as far as uh, from what I can read and it smells just like vomit <laughs> some old radio knobs are also made of this same kind of acrylic stuff and it's really strong smelling sometimes especially when they've been inside the drawer for a while haven't had a chance to air out yeah smells like a hangover and I didn't even do anything to deserve it oh well so now we have to undo the wires in here we need to get this board out so that it, it's possible to clean the controls they are just very very dirty and I, I've seen this happen before but this the ones in here were kind of exceptionally dirty I've never seen them completely prevent the radio from playing at all but you saw what it was doing until we cleaned the volume pot. Now these uh, tone control pots are just as bad. They, uh, they're very, very noisy, so we need to get at them to clean them. And yeah, you could probably uh, get a different straw on your can of deoxid or cleaner or whatever, control cleaner or whatever, and 
kind of try to wiggle around there and squirt it all, but it gets all over the place and it doesn't always, it gets more stuff <laughs> everywhere else than it does actually in the control itself. So I prefer to take it out and clean it properly. Okay, that was actually pretty easy. And here's the little bracket and we just have to put that back in when we put this in. And uh, so all we're going to do now is we're just going to clean these. Now I'm not going to disassemble them. They, they have lots of openings in them that we can get into and we should be able to clean it. Uh, I'll show you how we do one of them and then I'll do the rest of them off camera. Alright, so here's a couple things that might be a little bit useful to some of you, I don't know. But there seems to always be a lot of talk and confusion about control cleaner and how to use it and what type to use and what's, you know, all, there's so many rumors in the rumor mill. And you know me, I like to stir the pot. <laughs> and I sure did that with that one video I did about, you know, cleaning controls and using uh, deoxid and all that. But in all actuality, all of these things here are different. And I think the reason I chose these, these five in particular is I think these ones can cause some of the most confusion out there. So let's start from left to right what these are. This is by far the most common thing you hear about online. And of course everything's online these days. Everything is internet, internet, internet. And if Google says it, it must be true. <laughs> well, in all honesty, this is extremely, an extremely good product. But it has, to, it has certain purposes for why it's used, and it's very, very expensive. So first of all, there's a difference between the D5 and what they call D100, which is this. And the main difference is this contains basically min mineral spirits, is what I understand. It, it's it's designed for loosening the, the corrosion and dirt and things and cleaning, washing things out. So they're mixing 5% of the actual deoxid chemical with 95% of cleaning chemicals and propellant and things like that. So what you're paying for is essentially a can of this with 5% of this. That's not very economical in my opinion. So even for cleaning controls and so forth, this is an expensive way to go. It is nice because the cleaning chemical also acts as a carrier to get that 5%. You don't need a whole lot of this stuff to treat the contacts of a switch. You only need a tiny little amount. So this is good stuff, but I like to start by using a much less expensive cleaning product. And in this case, I just use these quick drying contact cleaners. This is a company called CRC. Uh, here in, in the United States, we have uh, a lot of big box hardware stores like Lowe's and Home Depot and places like that. And they all carry these, this product line uh, along with a lot of the automotive parts houses and things. They carry this stuff and it's good. Sometimes it comes in this blue can, sometimes it comes in a red and white can. It's the same stuff. And you just have to make sure you get the quick drying formula that leaves no residue and that's plastic safe. That's really what you're looking for. This stuff will evaporate and it won't leave anything behind. And it's really good for cleaning out controls, whether it be a potentiometer or whether it be a switch this stuff works all the time. So I, this is my go-to for, for in initially cleaning things. It's much less expensive than this. So I use this to clean. We'll get to these things here in a minute. And then I'll follow it up with just a little tiny amount of this to get a little bit of this, chemi this chemical on here. The, D, the D100 is very good because it does coat the contacts a little bit and gives them a little bit of protection against corrosion. So theoretically just cleaning it that corrosion could come back. This prolongs how long before it corrodes again. So this actually is good stuff. Uh, now 
the controversy <laughs> is why do they have a red deoxid and a green deoxid? And why is one called F, like this, and the other called D? Well, these are slightly different chemicals. Uh, the D5 is designed for contacts, switches, metal surfaces, things like that. And it works very well with that. The problem is this is, can be a little bit harsh on carbon composition potentiometers. Now this is where everybody gets their panties in a bunch when you start talking about it. And they say carbon can't, it won't, isn't affected by anything. Well that's true, the carbon is not. But you have to understand the way a potentiometer is put together. If you look inside here, I don't know how close I can zoom in without it going out of focus, but take a look inside there and you'll see right down in here, that little curved part there, that's, that's a carbon track. And it's not a solid piece of carbon, but rather it is a powdered carbon that is compressed using some binding agents to, to give it its form. It's not the carbon that's damaged by using the wrong chemicals on, on a carbon potentiometer, but it is the binding agent. And when that binding agent breaks down, it will actually cause the, the pot to start. You'll see you'll get this black smudge that will just keep rubbing off and off and off. And that's, that's the actual carbon powder coming apart with that, you know, with that binding agent breaking down. And it's not just this that can do that, and it doesn't always do that. That's another thing. Deoxit actually got to me, Keg Chemicals sent me an email and said that, is, that this does not affect most carbon comp potentiometers, but some of the older ones it can. That's where that came from, so understand that. The reason they came out with this other chemical called F5 fader lube is that it is a, it is a lot more gentle on that type of material. You can safely use this. I have never had any problems with this on even the oldest 1920s, 1930s carbon potentiometers. I have never had a problem using this. But again, it is extremely expensive. So I don't, and this is the same thing. It's, it's 5%, 95% is the, is the propellant and cleaning chemicals and you know whatever else. So very, very expensive to just sit there and hose something down with this. Uh, I only use it for the final treatment. So, long story short, I use this for potentiometers. I use this for all other metal surfaces like switches and contacts and even, even jack surfaces. You know, like for the RCA jacks, the, I'll clean them off using that because it'll leave that little coating on there and it, it takes away the corrosion and makes better contact. It's good stuff. But I always start out by using this for cleaning. If you need to hose something down, number one, it won't get all over the circuit board and leave that greasy smudge on there that gets coated with dust because it evaporates. And also, it does just as good a job of cleaning as these do, as far as the cleaning goes. Hope that helps. Now, these two things. You see the word WD-40, and I see this all the time. One person will comment that WD-40, uh, I, I like using WD-40 to clean controls. And somebody else will invariably come back and just lambaste them for doing that. Understand, the word WD-40, that's, that's become a trademark of this company. But that doesn't necessarily tell you what chemical you're using. <laughs> the original WD-40 is a water displacement, okay? And it's really not meant to be a lubricating oil, but rather a treatment to uh, protect things from, you know, from rust and corrosion. And it doesn't do a super good job of that. There's newer chemicals like the deoxid that does a much better job. But also it's used for cleaning. It will break things down. It'll break pretty, pretty nasty grease and stuff. It can break down and clean really well. But because of that, again, this is very, very bad to use on a potentiometer. I would never use this on any pot or anything. It's flammable. 
it will react with the pot you know it's, it's conductive somewhat um, it's just not good stuff to use for that uh, this is designed for cleaning surfaces and leaving a light coating on it you know metal surfaces okay that is not to be confused with WD-40 contact cleaner now this is essentially the same thing as this I don't know that there's much difference in the chemicals in it because of course I've never looked at it but it has the same properties as this clean sensitive electronic equipment plastic and metal safe leaves no residue it's quick drying it's basically this uh, so if you can get your hands on this and you can get it for a good price and it says you can spray it directly on printed circuit boards controls switches tape heads and precision instruments and plastics rubber and metal it's good stuff okay so again this can cost you a little more than this but it's still going to be a lot cheaper than these so when you're buying WD-40 for cleaners or when somebody says they use WD-40 this is what they mean okay and if they do mean this then I get I get your comment saying don't do that <laughs> totally different product these are not related what's inside these cans are two different chemicals okay so I hope that clears it up now let's clean these controls and let's uh, see how how it works okay because I have this stuff out we'll use it and we're going to use it for our initial cleaning and then we're going to follow it up with the fader lube F5 now the one thing I don't like about any can that comes with this is this type of nozzle they're they're convenient they're designed to you know you can spray like that if you want to spray like a cat in heat or you can flip this wand up and then you have the straw the thing is there's a little fitting down in there that seals against these that's supposed to keep this stuff from leaking and quite often they fail before you run out of the product in the can and then it ends up dripping down onto your hand and you get more stuff on your hand than you do in the control and you waste a lot of stuff so I absolutely detest these these types of nozzles and usually I will not buy them if I see that that being said there was a little shortage for a while that you could only get these horrible nozzles <laughs> from deoxid and as you saw on that that uh, d5 I was I was able to locate some of the kinds with the old nozzle style I will never buy these again these leak so bad you can see down in here just from each time I squirt it some of it runs down along here and there's nothing you can do to fix it these are so cheaply built that they just don't seal and I don't know why keg chemicals insists on making these but they suck and there's no, nothing will change my mind on that because I've had such bad experience all right let's clean this one control and it, again if we get it all over the place with this stuff we don't care because it's going to evaporate so we're going to move this back and forth the other thing you have to be aware of is when you use this stuff heavily like this that uh, damping grease that they put in there to make the control have that kind of fluidy feel when you turn it that stuff's going to wash out along with it and the pot's going to get really easy to move which some people like that but actually it's it's meant to be tight feeling when you rotate it and I showed you how to disassemble a pot and if it's a real expensive stereo with you know the Alps potentiometers high-end ones you do want to replace that grease and I showed you in other uh, videos how to do that and what to use so, so we're going to clean this out notice I always put a paper towel too I don't want to spray all the over spray and everything all over everything and get everything to if any gook does run out of there I don't want it running all over the inside of the device that I'm servicing okay that's feeling pretty good now and it should be clean and then what we're going to do is we're just going to follow it up with just a tiny little amount of this a little shot like that and one in this side and that's it 
That's it. I don't need any more. Okay, and then I usually will wipe the top part of this off here. I just don't like that oily stuff running all over the place. And yes, that 5% <laughs> is a lot more than you think. Uh, if it gets in the circuit board, you'll see the circuit board will get a sheen to it. And again, this is not this is not modern circuit board material. And a lot of times some of this stuff, this fiber board that they use on it, especially this stuff, it it can soften it. The deoxid chemical can soften it a little bit. I've seen deck switches on uh, old ham radio gear where people have just absolutely saturated them, embalmed them with that deoxid. And this part here, you know, the, the fiber part, got so soft that it would just chip off. If you just went like that, it would break off. And uh, it's not good to do that. <laughs> you only need a little bit. A tiny little bit helps it because if it dries out too much, it shrinks. And that also affects how the control works. So it's nice to have a little bit of that stuff in there, but you just don't want to oversaturate it. Okay, that's done. Now I'm going to do the same thing with these other ones and uh, we'll be right back. All right, the controls are all cleaned. So for the rest of this video, we'll finish it out. Let's talk about capacitors and recapping a receiver like this. Again, very controversial and very uh, big topic of discussion. And everybody, you'll hear all kinds of varying opinions online and comments and ridicules and everything else about it. I'll just give you my two cents worth, okay? Just from what I know, and you know, again, my knowledge of this is limited because this is a hobby for me. And uh, I can go by some of the practical knowledge I have but of course, there's so people that know so much more about this from experience than I do. My experience is what I do on in these videos as a hobby, not what I do every day when I go to work. So take what I say with a grain of salt and put your comments down below, it, you know, what your thoughts are. But here's what I think about recapping a receiver. Number one, if the receiver is non-functional, if it's broken, do not, my, my opinion is, no, you don't recap it because that's not going to fix it most of the time. And even if it is going to fix it, you want to know that first before you make that repair. So recapping to me, it can improve the performance of something if the capacitors are bad or depleted. Uh, but it's not an end-all be-all and it's not always 100% necessary. I look at it from this perspective, you know, when you buy, if you buy a classic used car and it's been sitting in someone's garage for a long time, you may look at the tires on that car and those tires may have brand new tread on them and they may look perfect and they may even be shiny and everything. But as soon as you take that car out on the road, it's, those tires are 20, 30 years old the tires will go flat <laughs> quite often. Not always, but a lot of times that happens. And capacitors are the same way. You know, just because they work when you first connect uh, something that's been sitting on the shelf for years and years and years and not being used, doesn't mean that it's gonna last another 30 years like that. These capacitors, electrolytic ones I'm talking about in, in, in general here, electrolytic capacitors have chemicals in them to make them do what they do. And those chemicals can change or can deteriorate or leak. Many things can happen to them over time. The rate at which that happens can vary greatly with the quality of the capacitor, with how the capacitor was stored, how it was used. Uh, many, many factors affect that. Looking at this stereo, it has been kept in a dry, good environment its whole life. You can tell just by how it looks. The capacitors don't seem to have any kind of bulging or any kind of, you know, uh, corrosion around them uh, or discoloration. And 
chances are these ones are going to be good. Now, you see a lot of people online on the repair videos using what's called an ESR meter. And that stands for equivalent series resistance. So I like this capacitor wizard just because it's quick and easy and I like the analog meter. But there's also you know, other ones you can use that are digital and they work just as well. Um, you know, one that's common on eBay, cheap Chinese one, is this MESR100. You see these all over the place. This works fantastic. It's the same thing. It's very good also. Either one, doesn't matter. You just want one that uses a 100 kilohertz test signal. Notice 100 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz. Why 100 kilohertz? Well, by having a very high frequency test signal, that allows this meter to get around a lot of other circuit or let a lot of other circuitry that's in the board. That way when you're testing the capacitor in circuit, you're testing the capacitor more than you're testing the surrounding circuitry. So unless something's almost like a dead short, that 100 kilohertz isn't affected by that. It allows you to check capacitors in circuit. That's why you want the 100 kilohertz, all right, if that makes sense. Now, different capacitors are made for different uh, applications. Some capacitors will read a little bit higher ESR than others. Now, the lower the capacitance, the higher the ESR is going to read, and that is perfectly normal. That's how it works. So you get one of these great big gigantic filter capacitors, you know, at the front end of your, your main power supply capacitors, 10,000 microfarads, 50 volts, these are going to have exceptionally low, they're almost going to read like a dead short at 100 kilohertz. Whereas when you get the small signal capacitors, such as these little tiny, you know, 4.7 microfarad, and the, this is a 47, but like the 4.7s, the 1 microfarad, the 2.2, they're going to have, you know, they may have a couple of ohms of ESR. ESR is equivalent series resistance. It's not a real resistance, <laughs> but essentially a capacitor can charge and discharge at a certain rate, and that rate is limited by any resistance that's in series with that capacitor. Because of the chemistry, because of the leads, you know, the metal leads that you know, allow you to connect the capacitor to the board, all of those things add a little bit of resistance internally. And so does the chemistry of the electrolytic capacitor itself. So there's just an inherent amount of resistance. And that, of course, is going to act like an RC time constant. It's going to slow down the progress of how quickly that capacitor can take a charge and release its charge. So, and of course, the higher the frequency you go, the more that's going to affect it. So if we tested this ESR at one megahertz, the, e, the resistance would read even higher. And if I tested it at a lower frequency, it would read lower ESR. That's how it works. So the bottom line is the industry standard is a 100 kilohertz test signal. And we you will see that different capacitors will react differently at that 100 kilohertz. So if I turn this on and I flip this board around, so here's a capacitor right here. It's 47 microfarads at 16 volts. And by the way, the voltage rating of the capacitor will affect that too. And you can see this one is about 1.5 about 1.3 ohms. See that? Whereas if we look at this one, what is it rated at? This one is a 100 microfarad at 16 volts, so it's double. And if we measure th this one, it's 1 ohm. Okay? Now, if I go and I look at these capacitors up here, let's flip this around here. Okay, going around to the back of the receiver, if we look at those big 10,000 microfarad caps, 
Let's see if I can reach around the camera here. You can see they read very, very low. Less than an ohm, about 0.2 ohms or 200 milliohms. And some of them will even read lower than that. All right. See, that one's even a little bit lower than this one. So this one's getting a little bit tired. See that? And so they're a little bit different. So you can see that one is showing a little bit of wear. And that's because of the chemistry. Now, maybe when we run this thing for a while and you put voltage across that capacitor, those chemicals will reform. That's what we call it. And it basically allows the capacitor to kind of rejuvenate itself a little bit. And some of them will do that if they've been sitting for a long time. But anyway, that's just a quick and dirty test you can do to see what kind of condition the capacitors are in. So here's some other big ones in the power supply. You can see that one's really good. That one's really good. Okay. So if we go through all of those, we can check that. And pretty much you'll see a trend. If the, it, usually if one of them's bad, most, you know, more of them will be bad. And uh, in most cases, when you take a big sampling of them and none of them are bad, probably all of them are going to be good. And that's one way to, to kind of give yourself an idea of where you are at the moment. Now, if this were my stereo for my personal use, I probably wouldn't recap it at this point in time because everything is looking pretty good. Um, but if this is going to be going to someone else who doesn't have the ability to, uh, to service these and who is planning on using it every day and using it for many years to come, then I will recap it because I think that that's an insurance policy. It's, it's that's the tires, you know, on the car. We're putting new tires on it to make sure that it's going to last as long as possible. Now that comes with its own consequences. If you notice all the different capacitors, why are some one brand and others another brand? I mean, these are capacitors up here even. Look at these. Do you think it was just because they were cheap? And, uh, you know, that's the comment you hear online a lot. Well, it's just because these companies are cheap and they buy the cheapest thing they can. Well, sometimes they do. But a lot of times they don't, especially with the more expensive equipment. Like this was a fairly mid-grade little receiver in its day, and they, they were good quality. The truth is that there are differences in electrolytic capacitors and how they react to different frequency ranges. And when you start getting into uh, dissipation factor slash loss tangent, and you get into ESR, you get into ripple current and things like that, you start to see differences. A 10 microfarad capacitor that's electrolytic can have different properties based on how it's made. So you can have two 10 microfarad 16 volt capacitors that will react very differently to a frequency curve and a amount of current being drawn across it. This isn't a big deal in linear power supplies. Linear meaning you have a transformer, it plugs into the mains, it's running at 50 or 60 hertz. When it's rectified, you have 120 hertz ripple and this capacitor is filtering it out. Most capacitors will work in that range all the same. There won't be a big difference. However, when you get onto boards like this, you're putting audio frequency in it. And that can be anywhere from 20 hertz or even subsonic frequencies of below 20 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz or even higher. And in that big range, these are going to have a characteristic curve as to how they'll pass that signal through them. Even more so is when you get up into a tuner section, there are certain parts of the tuner that are going to be uh, exposed to higher frequencies. Now, Anything in the RF area will not have an electrolytic capacitor. It'll either be ceramic or mica or something like that because those are special. They're designed for high frequency and they don't have their loss tangent and so forth is very different than uh, 
an electrolytic capacitor. And that's a completely different subject that we won't talk about. We're only talking about the electrolytics right now. So again, putting the wrong capacitor in here can change the way a uh, stereo sounds. So for instance, if, if this was in the bass and treble circuitry, or if these were coupling capacitors between these transistors to isolate the DC voltage between them, well, <laughs> if you put a different type of capacitor than this, even if it's electrolytic, you, let's say you put one that's designed for switched mode power supplies, and they're designed to have very high frequencies on them and so forth, you know, 20, 30 kilohertz, you will see, you will notice that the sound will be a little bit different. Also, a lot of these low, uh, low value caps, a lot of people, including myself, in some instances, will replace these electrolytics with a film capacitor. And let's see if I have one handy I could show you. So here's a film capacitor. There's no chemicals or anything in it at all. It is made of you know, a metallized mylar film that's kind of rolled up. And it has a very different characteristic than an electrolytic capacitor. And as you might imagine, it can affect the sound. What it usually does is at the higher frequencies, it will pass them a little with a little bit less attenuation. And the high frequencies will sometimes sound a little more sparkly or shimmery, you want to say. Some people don't like that. They say it sounds harsh. Uh, when people talk about a stereo sounding warm or good, usually they mean that the, the treble kind of rolls off a little bit. Uh, so that it doesn't sound so harsh on your ears. And, uh, okay, I'm sounding like one of those audiophile people, but I, I try to look at this from a scientific standpoint that you can back up with, uh, you know, with <laughs> real words uh, or with real science. Um, but it is the truth. There is some truth to that, okay? And it will affect that. So if you want the exact sound that this thing had when it was new, you will want to replace this with capacitors that have similar uh, characteristics. And you can get, you can go crazy with that. But it, in most cases, a standard capacitor that's, uh, you know, that's good quality, you know, with low ESR will work very well in these. And because it's an electrolytic, it will have a little more roll off at high frequencies than a film capacitor. It's just the way they work. And that's done on purpose. Now, a lot of times you see those orange capacitors, especially for instance, in the uh, Pioneer and Marantz and so forth stereos, you'll see those orange capacitors, they're bright orange. And those ones are called low leakage capacitors. And the ESR meter doesn't read leakage. <laughs> it reads equivalent series resistance. Leakage is the amount of, is like having a resistor across the capacitor rather than in series with the capacitor. Let's think of it that way. And so the capacitor, that, that, that parallel resistance will actually bleed down the capacitor a little bit over time and that affects the sound. And a low leakage capacitor will not do that. That affects the sound. That's why those are in there. And if you replace it with a standard electrolytic, it can change the sound a little bit. Some people won't notice it. You know, if you're hooking it up to your, you know, to your sound design speakers <laughs> that you bought at the thrift store, you probably won't notice a difference. But if you're connecting it to a decent set of speakers and, and you have some decent listening material and so forth, then you will notice a difference. And that's, that's reality. Uh, that's not audio foolery. So the choice that you make on these capacitors is a little bit important. The ones that you make in your power supply are a little less important. What you really want to make sure with these is that they're durable. You want ones that are, have a high voltage or a high uh, temperature rating. For instance, this is a 105 degree C capacitor. Essentially, these will last longer than an 85 C. In most cases, not always 100% of the time, but generally. Okay, so 
And then you notice most of these are 85C because that was the common design back when these were being made. Capacitors have come a long way since these were made and some of, you know, they have some pretty high quality ones out there for that. But again, different capacitors, different uses. You notice I'm not telling you which ones to use because you really have to look up the spec sheets and look at those characteristics I'm talking about and compare them to, to what these are and to the application in which they're being used. Okay, Yamaha did a really good job on the schematic and service manual for this receiver. And if we look in this section right here, this is that board right here that we were looking at, this tone control board. That's it right here. And if you look further into the service manual, they have a page dedicated to that. So let's see if we can look at this without it falling all over the place here. <laughs> All right, so here's just that board by itself, the schematic, and down here are the associated parts layout for the board. So for instance, here's your, your input capacitor, all right? It's a 10 microfarad at 16 volts, and it is C601, and if we look in here, we can actually go to the uh, to the board and we can look up C601. All right, of course they don't show us. Yeah, there it is. 10 at 16. There's one of them. And they're, well, no, they don't, they don't mark these, do they? They just give you the values. But you can see here's your input, right, left, and earth. And you can see there's your one input capacitor, 10 at 16, and there's the other one, 10 at 16. So if we go up to the top here of this board, and I'm just doing this as an exercise here. So here's your right and left input to the board, and here's your two capacitors, and they're 10 microfarad at 16 volt. And you can see they're, they're perfect. But let's pull one. Let's do some tests on it and let's compare it to some other capacitors. Let's turn the camera on, huh? Okay. And again, you don't have to have one of these fancy desoldering tools. You can use solder braid, you can use a, you know, one of those pumps, uh, and you can just heat it up with your iron and just kind of work it out, pull it out, and then clean the hole out. Doesn't really matter. But here it is, here's our 10 at 16. This is a pretty standard capacitor. Made by what, Mitsubishi or something? Is that what that little triangle stands for? You guys should know that. I sure don't. All right, let's check it out. Okay, let's do a little experimenting <clears throat> on this capacitor that we pulled out. And as you can see, it's 10 microfarads at 16 volts. And if you remember, the ESR didn't test out too bad. All right, but let's put it on the LCR meter and see how it checks out at different frequencies. Now we're gonna look at two factors. We're going to look at the capacitance versus frequency, and we're going to look at the dissipation factor. So what is dissipation factor? Capacitors aren't completely efficient. They're not perfect capacitors. There is no such thing. And dissipation factor, well, in electrolytic capacitors and things with higher capacitance, we refer to it as dissipation factor. Whereas in like film caps and low capacity capacitors, high frequency capacitors, we call it uh, loss tangent or tangent delta. And really they're interchangeable terms almost. It's just that one of them uses, uses a phase angle you know, as the rating, and the other one uses an actual number. Um, same, same thing. It's really a ratio of the equivalent series resistance, or the ESR, that we measured earlier, to its capacitive reactance at a given frequency. Okay? So essentially, dissipation factor is tied to frequency and it's tied to 
the internal leakage of a capacitor, really. Because what happens is some of the energy that's stored as a charge in that capacitor will get dissipated as heat because the capacitor will be leaky. And the worse that is, the less efficient the capacitor is, the more it goes from being a capacitor to being a resistor. So it's an important factor to, to test. And it's, believe it or not, it's in there on purpose for some capacitors. It depends on what the application of the capacitor is. So let's look at our original one. So this is our, this is supposed to be 10 microfarads at 16 volts. And I have the test frequency set to 100 hertz, so which this would be similar to a full wave rectified signal uh, over in Europe where you have a 50 hertz mains frequency, right? So let's look at that. And look at that. This 10 microfarad capacitor that we thought had good ESR, so that says it's a good cap, right? It's only testing at 4.8 microfarads. <laughs> so there's a problem right there, and that's just at line frequency. And you can see the dissipation factor is 0.145, and you're going to see the lower this number is, the more efficient the capacitor is, the less, the less it's con it converts its charge into heat, and the more it can transfer its energy back out of the capacitor. So we want that to be as low a number as possible. Now if we go up in frequency, let's go to the United States where we have 60 hertz mains, and that would be a 120 hertz ripple if we rectified it full wave. And you can see the capacitance drops. Now it's only reading as a 4.7 microfarad capacitor, so it's less than half of what its rating is. This is a bad cap. And you can see the dissipation factor gets a little bit worse. Now let's pretend that this is in an audio circuit, because guess what? It is. This is the capacitor that's right at the entrance point of the tone control board. So the signal coming out of your tuner or your tape deck or your phono or whatever goes through this capacitor before it gets to the tone control and to the amplifier. So you can have frequencies between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz, right? So at one kilohertz, that's about middle range. We test everything at that, right? Now it's only a 3.9 microfarad capacitor, and 0.265 is your dissipation factor. Now let's go up to 10 kilohertz. This would be a real high frequency symbol crash or something. And now the capacitance is down to 3 microfarads. And your dissipation factor is now up over a whole number, so it's 1.147. Any venture to guess what's going to happen at 100 kilohertz? And look at that. 1.2 microfarads, that's what 1280 nanofarads is. And your dissipation factor is way up there. So this is definitely a badly depleted capacitor. I guarantee you when it was brand new it was not like that. But with age, the chemistry in the capacitor will change. And this is one of the consequences of that. So it's not as efficient anymore. Now every capacitor is going to drop in value with frequency unless you get into a high frequency film or mica or uh, ceramic capacitor. They're all going to have this problem. But to varying degrees. Okay, now let's look at these capacitors. And I've just picked five samples here, <laughs> and they're all 10 microfarads. And I'll write them down, and what I've done is I've made a spreadsheet real quick on the computer and printed it out. And we're going to check those same parameters on all of these capacitors. This first one is a just a cheap generic this actually came out of a kit uh, that I got from China for something I ended up not using it so it's a just a generic Chinese made low cost capacitor it's 10 microfarads at 50 volts here is a Nichicon fi fine gold FG series audio grade capacitor and it's also rated at 10 microfarads at 35 volts this is an Elna 
SOMIC 2 capacitor. These are very highly regarded for audio, for being in the audio path. And it's again rated at 10 microfarads at 25 volts. This is a Nichicon UKT or KT series audio grade capacitor. It's again, it's 120, it's a uh, 105 degree C capacitor. These are really good quality caps. And again, it's 10 at 25. And just for some reference, this is a automotive grade industrial capacitor. It's a Nichicon BT series. Very expensive. It's 125 degree C uh, temperature rating. It's designed for uh, heavy use, like in cars and things where you're going to be exposed to the elements. And this is a very high quality capacitor. And it's 10 microfarads at 50 volts. So these are all pretty much the same rating. Uh, let's see how they check out. Okay, at 100 hertz, this cheap Chinese capacitor, look at that. That is some pretty amazing, uh, look how low the, the dissipation factor, and it's right at 9.9 .9 microfarads. And if we go up the line, I'm just going to show you, this is what we're going to do on all of them. It's still almost 10 microfarads at 120 hertz. 1 kilohertz starting to drop off a little bit. Dissipation factor starting to go up. 10 kilohertz. And you can see it's really dropping, but that's still not bad. This is actually a, actually a pretty good quality cap as far as the performance goes. We don't know how long it'll last. And then at 100 kilohertz, as you would expect, it's an electrolytic cap. 3.3 microfarads and your dissipation factors up there. So I'm going to do this with all of them and I'm going to write it down and fill out that chart and let's look at the results. Okay, the figures don't lie, do they? <laughs> so this was not a fair assessment of this original capacitor because of course it's old and it is depleted. And I think that proves the point that recapping a receiver even that appears to be good can and will very often improve the performance of that device. Now, look at this chi Chinese cap. It did pretty good. All right. And if we go down the list, the, actually the Nichicon Fine Gold, you can see that it did not read very well at all. It had a very high dissipation factor at high frequencies, and it was all over the place. So it could be that I didn't have the meter. I did run it through twice and it pretty much tracked with this. But this cap might have been sitting for a while and it may need to be reformed. Uh, I don't know. But that's definitely not fantastic. And if I use, and that's, a, that's one in a small body. You see this is a standard size one and this one is 10 at 50. So it's a little bit higher voltage, but if we do the tests on it, we'll see. Okay, there you go. There's 100 hertz, 120. See, this one's tracking a lot better. And again, this one's been sitting in the bin a while too. And there's 1 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, not too terrible and 100 kilohertz. Actually performs very well like that. So this little tiny cap here just might have been sitting on the shelf for too long. But that gives you an idea. Uh, two of them stand out though. I mean, the I always use these KT series. They're very inexpensive. They're 105 degree caps. They last a really long time. And you can see they perform really well for audio, for audio path. But really, when you look at the Elna, it's a fantastic capacitor. And if you look at the industrial one, look at, look at these numbers. Even at 10 kilohertz, it's still almost 10 microfarads. And look at the dissipation factor. It never crosses one, even at 100 kilohertz. 
big difference. And I will tell you, ask yourself this, what happens if you're listening to a 10 kilohertz sound through each of these caps? What do you think it would do? It's going to attenuate it a little bit, isn't it? So they're going to be different. Now these ones are going to be kind of close, but there are differences. And more importantly, leaving your 30-year-old capacitors in there, this is what you'll see if you actually test it. Again, if we do an ESR test, that'll tell us that, you know, the cap doesn't have high ESR. So let's turn this on. So this is the original one. We'll put this on there. Yeah, that one's pretty bad. <laughs> so that was part of the other problem is there probably was a resistor in there or something that we were reading. Let's look at this one. This was the worst of the bunch because like I said, I think it's been sitting for a while. And you can see it's ESR is the same. Let's look at the Chinese one. A little bit better, but it's still not in the good. Of course, it's because it's only 10 microfarads. How about this Elna, which is a really good cap? How about that? So they're, comparat they're comparable. There's the KT, and here's the high end cap, <laughs> and that's what it looks like. So if we did an ESR evaluation, all of these are in a similar range. This is the only one that sh showed really low ESR. So you can't just go by an ESR meter only. It'll tell you a few things, it won't tell you everything. So I'll leave you with this question. To recap or to not recap, what do you think? I sure read a lot online and hear a lot of comments and some people get very belligerent about it that you don't need to recap a 30 year old receiver if the caps look good and if they are not leaking and if the ESR is good. After this test I'm not so sure. How about you? So I think this is a long enough video and I don't think you need to sit here and watch me solder capacitors in and out. But I can tell you that my mind is made up and that I am going to recap this entire receiver. If you want to see a video of that and just do a solder and chat like we originally talked about, because this kind of turned into a uh, cleaning chemicals and recapping video, but if you want to actually see me replace the caps, let me know down in the comments section and I'll, I'll do a video on that and that'll be my next video. If not, I'll move on to the next thing after this project's done. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. I know I sure learned a few things. I always do when I do this. But uh, as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives above all. I wish you all well, and we'll see you again real soon with the next video, whatever it ends up being. Take care, everybody, and stay well. Bye-bye.